So welcome everybody. This is the talk of Stefan, health promotion responses to the COVID-19 pandemic. And the first question that I will ask uh, Stefan is what can health promotion contribute in terms of management of the pandemic? Thank you, Gov. Of course, as Gov just mentioned, um, this is of course a situation that's unprecedented. And I don't need to explain that part of the story too. I think uh, if you look at not only the threat of, the, of a very important disease, but especially also all the measures that have been taken to, to, uh, to prevent the virus from spreading, um, it's something that we haven't seen yet before. It's probably one of the biggest uh, behavioral uh, experiments in mankind that we are now living and witnessing. And also the consequences of that on our daily lives, you know, of course, the economic consequences, but also in terms of people feeling enclosed and having less contacts or less opportunities to have contacts. So there's a huge impact that we are all facing with. And within all, um, one could ask themselves, yourself the question, what does health promotion have to contribute? Isn't this mainly a problem for epidemiologists and doctors, nurses, and let's say the caring professors uh, profession, sorry, that are really uh, key here. But I think, uh, in fact, health promotion has an important role to play, and I think probably more important than ever before. Um, I think for a, a number of good reasons. First of all, um, as we all are, are aware, a, a lot of it involves pre preventive behavior change. So many of the measures that need to be put in place involve the changing of our behavior, not only by citizens, but also by health workers uh, within the healthcare sector. Secondly, um, the fact that we are confronted by, by such a dramatic situation means that um, amongst the population, there's the feeling often that our system for health and healthcare, public health and healthcare, is not really up to standards and does not manage to cope with it. So it means that there's a loss of control or at least a perception of loss of control. In some cases, unfortunately, that is the case. In other cases, it might be just a perception, but perceptions are also important. So um, there is a need for people to regain control and regaining control over one's life and over the things that impact on disease and health is of course something that is at the heart of health promotion. And so I think that health promotion can help to, uh, to tackle the pandemic and its consequences. And that not only by looking at the downstream level where people act and behave, but also at the midstream, so more organizational level interventions, hospitals, but also organizations, schools, uh, enterprises, and so on and so forth. And uh, last but certainly not, least also at the upstream level, the level where uh, governments act. So um, on the next slide, um, I would then like to show the important, first of all, at the downstream level. As, as Joe said in his introduction to this, uh, uh, to this um, seminar, um, the, all over the world, health authorities have, of course, acted already. They have tried to make people develop and, and, and state protective behavior. And the way they did that is the way that governments often act. So they provide information, hoping that people will take it up. Sometimes that was not enough. Most of the time that was not enough. So they uh, also issued warnings. And in many cases, there were also legal restrictions to make sure that people would behave in a safer way. Um, this was sometimes effective, but not always effective. And especially in the beginning of the pandemic, we noticed that many of the health warnings were basically not, not attended to and not uh, listened to. Um, very often, the first reaction also of governments was then that, oh, those who don't act on our warnings are, are irresponsible. They're selfish. They are not really... Um, doing what we are wanting them to do. Now, that, of course, is a very understandable reaction on the part of the government, but I think it helps to look at what health behavior specialists can say about this, and I think health promotion are also health behavior specialists. If we look at the many models that we have been using for 
techniques now to understand health-related behavior. Um, and I'm not going to give a whole expose about the different models, but by and large, what we can say is that just giving information or issuing health warnings or even uh, imposing legal restrictions will not do the job because people will only act on health warnings if a number of conditions apply. First of all, people have to apply the health warnings to themselves. They have to believe that they are personally vulnerable and susceptible. So if I think that um, it's not me who's going to, to suffer from COVID when I get infected, um, but somebody else might, then of course I will be less likely to change my behavior and protect myself, keep the distance, uh, wear masks and so on. If I think that maybe, yes, I can be infected, but I don't have chronic disease, I'm, I'm not that young, but I'm not over 85, so I can, I can have the idea or the belief that the consequences will actually not be so severe. That again is a reason why people will not necessarily change their behavior. And uh, another condition is that um, we have to believe also in the effectiveness of what we are asked to do. If someone thinks that wearing a face mask is not really going to help very much, or if social distancing is not really the best way, then of course that is also going to have an impact on the behavior. And last but not least, we have to be able, even if we believe that we're susceptible to, to being infected, that the consequences are severe, and that it's possible and important to, um, to, for example, protect ourselves, if we see ourselves as incapable of doing it, we will not do it. So we know that normally all these consequences have to be in place for the health warnings to have an impact on the behavior. And we can tell that in the case of COVID-19, that's not always the case. We, already gave some examples of that. So that's, um, that's one of the reasons why we understand that we um, don't see the, the behavior change that we had hoped for, uh, especially not in the beginning of the uh, epidemic. And that uh, means it's not just because people are selfish or stupid, it's because we don't use the right way of informing. Now, there's another caveat as well. Uh, we can also overdo things, and that's something we can also see happening in COVID. Um, when people are uh, too scared, when anxiety is too high, which in, in a lot of cases is also uh, seen um, with regard to COVID-19, then people will not necessarily change their behavior, they will change their cognitions, their thoughts, because nobody likes to be anxious all the time. So uh, what we then see is that people will basically tell themselves that it's not really that bad. We know this happens. We've seen it for tobacco. We've seen it for HIV AIDS. So this also is very likely to happen with regards to COVID-19. And if this gets extreme forms, people will not just cognitive avoidance strategies. They may downright avoid uh, getting knowledge, getting informed. People are also capable of showing resistance to becoming uh, informed about health. So I think uh, these are some of the things we should keep in mind. Um, and in the next slide, uh, both of you want to go there. We now come to a, a different stage. And despite the fact that indeed, as Bill said uh, earlier on, that uh, WHO is also even today saying that the, the, the epidemic, the pandemic, sorry, is still further developing. In Western Europe, for example, and in Australasia as well, we see that um, thanks to the lockdown that uh, there is more control. And now the massive uh, protective uh, measures that have been taken are being relaxed. We are um, uh, being a bit more flexible about certain behaviors. Now, that's again a problem of behavior, not the behavior change as such, but the behavior maintenance. Because despite the fact that um, we can be a little bit less worried and we have the feeling that some of the worst uh, can be controlled, it can only be controlled if we maintain the behavior that protects us from being infected. And what we see already is that as the measures are being relaxed, that people are beginning to, to show uh, less protective behavior. And again, this is something we know from behavior uh, research. Um, protective behavior will only be 
maintained um, under given circumstances. And the changing of behavior, making people change their behavior, is not the same as maintaining that behavior. So uh, relying on health warnings, fewer appeals and legal restrictions will not, again, do the job. And that's what we see happening now. So what we should do uh, at this stage is to use more effective ways of changing the behavior in, in the sense of maintaining behavior change. Uh, and what can help there is, first of all, establishing social norms. So if we have the norm, if we see that it is expected of us, just because it's imposed, but because we believe that is something we are we should do, that is something that is certainly a much more powerful way of influencing the behavior and maintaining the change to protect ourselves. Uh, another way of doing that is to to make changes in the context. If we have a context that facilitates the uh, behavior, of course, we will be more likely to do that. And uh, you see that already being applied in the form of nudges. I know that within health promotion, nudging is and remains somewhat controversial, but it is, of course, also a way to create a context that, that elicits and, and, and uh, encourages protective behavior. So if we have uh, lines on the floor or availability of face masks, uh, these things will be much more um, uh, important or much more effective than issuing warnings not in the, in the point or the, at the place where people have to maintain the behavior. And on, last but not least, I think um, one thing we can try to establish and, and, and hope to establish is the power of habits. Uh, habits are incredibly important in, in maintaining behavior. And if we manage to make it into a habit that people protect themselves, keep a social distance, wash their hands and so on, uh, then I think we can, we can see much more effects of that. Um, habit is something which can work against behavior change, but once you have established the behavior, that's uh, that's much more preventative. And uh, of course, uh, it is very powerful. We see that with toothbrushing, for example, we brush our teeth because we do it, um, and not because each time we think very, very elaborately that we really have to do it to avoid certain problems with our teeth. So um, once we get into the, the stage where we can make preventative behavior against COVID-19 a habit, I think we would be on the right track. And so that's more at the level of the, um, of the downstream. If we now go to the next slide, then um, we can go a little bit more up and move to the midstream level. Because um, we can, of course, expect people to change their behavior and, and, and try to do our best there at an individual level. But it's even better if we manage to also influence and empower organizations and communities to help people to, to adopt preventative behavior. Um, and in order to do so, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I think we can also really build on uh, the knowledge that exists within communities and organizations. Um, I think it's, it would be uh, uh, not using not using the existing knowledge uh, specifically on how an organization or a community really works, I think would be a shame and would be a missed opportunity because um, community partners are the ones who really know what makes people tick within their community. They know the habits also culturally defined. And, and uh, those are the facts that can help to translate the more general and generic uh, advice into more specific and useful um, hints and make uh, and, and take into account also the sensitivities within certain communities, whether it's age related or culturally related, or um, in, in terms of the, the less, uh, the more vulnerable populations, I think it's especially worthwhile there. Um, this can not only lead to a better um, uh, effectiveness of the measures, but also strengthen the capacities of the communities themselves, not only to deal with this, with this problem, but also the future problems uh, related to COVID-19 or even for other uh, problems that present in the future. So uh, we know from, um, from research in health promotion that resilience and trust are factors that really play a key role. And so I think it's important to try and, and reinforce those as well. So apart from 
being a good avenue and a good place where we can try to, to, uh, to get the information across, I think we should also uh, try to strengthen the capacities of the organizations themselves. And again, this is something health promotion knows about. This is something we've been doing for decades um, regarding other problems, um, but I think we can build on it. It means that we have to also look into the available strengths and, and, and strengthen those, uh, but uh, of course that is something we are going to do. So that was my long answer to the first question. Back to you. Thank you very much.